Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm Robert Expertero with Shirat Choi. I'm going to talk today about LLMs on the edge. Shirat, LLMs have been around for a long time, but they have not typically been associated with the edge, first of all, and second, they've changed quite a bit since they were first introduced. What are you seeing? We have seen evolution of LLM from a very small model to very large model to, again, a more distilled and smaller model as well as we have seen LLMs to evolve to understand not just text-based input, but also uh, image-based input or videos or voices, right? So the LLMs have also evolved towards like uh, supporting tools or using remote calls as a way to actually enhance their capacity, enhance their knowledge. And this creates a very interesting set of challenges especially on the edge devices, because on the edge devices we are bandwidth and power limited. And so we want to discuss that, like how uh, enhancement in LLM, enhancement in models and the architectures has actually uh, moved the application domain from purely data center towards more edge focused. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Sharad, what are we looking at? So this is a very simplified version of an LLM architecture. And what we have is uh, basically how uh, input comes in, how it gets tokenized, and how it gets transformed into an output. And uh, what we are looking at is like internal implementation details at a slightly deeper level, right? So as the input comes in, the first step we do is to actually create tokens out of inputs. And uh, this is an important step because tokens is basically vocabulary for the LLM. So for us, a vocabulary is basically a word, right? Like for English, there is every word is our vocabulary. For LLMs, uh, that's not necessarily true. Uh, it's all about information that can be represented in bytes. So uh, when initially LLM started, we started with a vocabulary of 32,000 tokens, right? And currently we are at like 128,000 tokens. Uh, this is just for text. But as we grow towards image-based model, model, uh, modulation, we have the vocabulary that really doesn't uh, restrict itself to just tokens. It's not a discrete vocabulary, but it's a continuous space of like representation that allows us to actually map the patches of the image into tokens. What do these tokens actually do? So these tokens basically uh, reduce the problem space from uh, a specific uh, representation, right? For example, um, the way we phrase a question might be different in different language. Or uh, if, if I'm directly translating voice, the way I phrase the question in text versus in voice is going to be different token. But for LLM, this token represent more distilled down uh, a representation for what needs to be processed. How do these tokens compare to weights? So these tokens are just representation of what input and output is generated, right? But the weights are basically the parameters that model learns during the training phase. And the parameters are basically associated within the transformer blocks. So an LLM is a series of transformer blocks. And what we do is we take, after tokenization, we take those tokens through each transformer block, which actually transforms the embedding from one space to another space of the embedding. And at the end of the transformer block, we basically have to sample. So uh, let's say we have uh, 32,000 tokens that we need to choose from. And the sampling phase basically selects that, hey, I want to ch be selecting the best possible probability for my token. Uh, the simplest example, right? I, we can take an input as like may the force, right? And the next token that we need to sample can be B, then next one be width, then next one is be U. Or the weights are basically the, the information that each of these transformer block have learned during the training phase. And one of the challenges here is you have so many of these tokens that you want to be able to process these as fast as possible, right? But also with the lowest amount of power. Yes. So, so uh, LLMs are slightly special in terms of like how they operate. So first important thing to notice is the nature is autoregressive. So what it means is that every time you have to generate an X token, you need to know all the previous tokens. Because they're, the, what, what they are doing is they are predicting the next word or next token. They're always predicting the next token. Even if they are reasoning, even if they are generating the images, they're always predicting the next token. 
this is pretty much comparable to what you do on Prefetch with a Google uh, search, right? Where they pretty much know you've got all these suggestions that are coming up. Yes, so when, when we are typing like uh, text or something on a phone, right? Like we get the suggestion and these suggestions are more statistical uh, representation of what we might be typing and the, the, the model can learn based on that, right? But LLM is doing that on the entire knowledge base that humans have. So LLM is doing that from entire web, entire books, uh, all the like maybe math and physics or even computer programs, right? Like that we have written uh, for uh, any language, C++, Python. So LLMs basically are learning how to predict the next token given all the previous tokens. And this can be any language. Like we have multiple language support in LLMs, we have multiple modalities. So given, like there can be specialization, but typically the large LLMs are extremely general because uh, next token prediction, it, it, it's, it's a difficult task. It lets you learn not just about the tokens, but also what the meanings behind the token is. So how do you harness all this in an effective way? That's really the problem you're running into, right? Yes, so so when we look at deeper, slightly deeper into a transformer block, what we have here is uh, we have embeddings that are coming in and those embeddings get projected into uh, keys, queries, and values. And these embeddings then used for attention. The keys, queries, and values are used for attention where based on what tokens or what questions we need to respond to, we can focus on a specific set of words that we have generated before or given as an input, right? And that goes through, the output of attention goes through a multi-level multi perceptron block or MLP block. And we finally get the final embedding of the transformer block, right? So the current architecture, the majority of the base are actually coming from this MLP block. Like um, we can say around 90 to 95% of the base for larger models are actually part of this block. And uh, most of the enhancement that has been done recently uh, in terms of mixture of expert is to be able to reduce the complexity or reduce the cost of having large weights here. Where do engineers typically run into problems when they're working with this? Uh, the, the biggest challenge would be to actually uh, store such LLMs on the edge devices and retrieve such LLMs uh, every cycle, or sorry, every iteration. So every iteration or every step that a token is being generated, we need to be able to read all the weights again because the weights are quite big. Weights are at the order of billion parameters. And we need to be able to uh, retrieve such weights at every token generation. And this is why there's so much focus right now on these very large AI data centers, right? <laughs> we want to bring it down to a much smaller level. Yes, yes. And uh, so the data center problem is slightly different because data center can aggregate the incoming requests together. On the edge devices, there is only one request at a time. And so for edge devices, uh, one or few requests at a time. Let me correct myself. For, so for edge devices, it becomes very critical on how to optimize the bandwidth. We, we actually start using techniques like quantization, where uh, low bit representation, like we can reduce the 16 bit weights into like 2.5 bit weights, still maintaining the accuracy. Uh, we use techniques where even activation are quantized, like instead of running everything or storing everything in vFloat 16, we can store it in like FP8 or FP4 format. And so these techniques reduces how much bandwidth do we use, as well as how much storage do we use. How accurate do they have to be? That's a that's a great question. Uh, I think I think it, it goes into an application domain, right? Like some um, uh, one very uh, easy way to think about these applications is basically uh, toys, cogs, and agents. So toys, but basically means that you're just playing with it, and if you're just playing with it, then you don't really have to be like extremely accurate. If you're just generating an image, it doesn't necessarily have to be extremely accurate about each pixel. But if you're doing a translation, those becomes like a very robust tool. And those are the cogs. So those we, we are actually dependent on. And there, you are looking for more robustness in terms of how accuracy. So the quantization helps slim it down, but so does the uh, less accuracy too, right? Quantization is a trade-off in the accuracy. Um, uh, we do see like uh, maybe in the range of 1% to 2% drop in accuracy, and we try to limit ourselves in that range uh, during the quantization. But it also enables... Uh, four to five x improvement in terms of total performance. And so that trade-off will actually, uh, has to be done by the application developer. 
Where do you see these actually running? Is it going to be in edge data centers or is it going to be on edge devices? So a uh, couple of years back when LLMs actually started evolving, uh, the only use case that we had was this number one use case, which was text input goes to the LLM and generate a text output. And I'm, I'm skipping some steps here of like tokenization and sampling. But at overall, there is a text input, LLMs, and text output. And since then, things have evolved quite a bit, right? Like the first step that happened was we were able to understand the images. So we were able to take the text and images together. We were able to embed the image information into tokens. And these can be many, many tokens. So one image, for example, which is like 512 by 512, can be represented into 1,000 tokens. So this can be significant amount of tokens, but still we were able to represent the entire image into token space, and that is pretty phenomenal. That means that the, the token space had the ability to understand the images. And once we know that token space had the ability to understand the images, this is the image understanding, we can use the same concept to actually generate the image. Because what we are trying to do is instead of like just understanding the tokens for the image patches, we also want to generate the tokens for the image patches. And the LLM, by notion of like where to focus the attention, it knows where the patch is and which adjacent, which which patch that the current patch that it's generating is adjacent to. So you can change the resolution. You can you don't have to be just restricted to like the same resolution. You can change the resolution and still LLMs will be able to figure out like how to continue the image generation in a more consistent format. The the big benefit of LLM that we see here is the ability to actually keep the context. Because LLMs have the entire context of what it has generated before. So that ability to keep context is very useful to be consistent across frames. So we see that for video generation or uh, for image modification, LLMs are more suited than other diffusion-based models. You're talking about a lot of, of data here, though, when you're dealing with an image, right? And as you get into moving images, video, you're into a, even more data. Yes, so the current approach for understanding the videos here is actually translating the videos into number of images. And those images are not necessarily uh, uh, processed in a higher resolution, right? We are not really processing 4K at the moment. We are processing, downsampling them into 384 by 384 and we are processing that. And a uh, major reason behind that is like, we want to make this application as edge friendly as possible. Because high resolution just means more tokens and more tokens means more power, that you need to burn through and like more bandwidth that you need to burn through it. And so your accelerators, how do they actually zero in on this and what do they actually do that's different? So uh, one of the things or one of the challenge that I didn't mention here for image processing and image understanding is uh, there is a part which actually takes an image and converts it into an embedding space, which is called, we call it as the encoder part. And there is a part which actually takes from embedding space and generates the image, which we call it as a decoder part. So we are not only just processing LLM by themselves, we are actually processing convolutional and um, image transformer, which are actually enabling us to do encoding and decoding together with LLM. And all these things has to actually be processed on edge devices. Now, uh, encoders and decoders are not that com uh, costly in terms of bandwidth. They are smaller models but uh, they do require a significant amount of processing per pixel to be able to uh, go from compressed embedding space to actually the image path space. What, what challenges that we see is actually uh, uh, not just to manage bandwidth and power, but also having a coherent software tool chain that allows you to run things on both image processing task, image generation task, as well as LLM uh, processing task. What about all the information in the LLMs? How do you handle all that? So uh, LLMs typically have a knowledge cutoff. So uh, based on when they were trained, the data set has a certain knowledge cutoff. Like if I'm training an LLM with data set from 2023, then it does not know anything intrinsically in its parameter, which is done after 2023. And that's kind of one of the big challenges in terms of like being up to date with what's really happening in the like uh, current news, for example, right? So uh, the the techniques that LLM have learned, and I really mean that, that they have learned that by themselves, is to be able to use tools. And this is more like a reinforcement learning uh, approach to improve the LLM's ability to actually use something outside what they know. So 
uh, what LLMs can do here is basically they can call a web search as a tool to say that, hey, let me search this for you and let me extract the information from those pages and then make up my own opinion or summarization on top of that. And those LLMs have already been trained, right? So now basically what you're doing is saying, okay, they've been trained to learn. Yes. So uh, they have been trained uh, on uh, how to actually understand most of the information that's already there. If you ask LLM to say that, hey, when is the next release date for Minecraft movie, uh, it knows that it doesn't have that information with itself. It hasn't been trained on that. And based on that, it can actually ask a web search tool, for example, to come up and uh, find that web pages and then extract information from that web page. And we see that this, in, this type of processing it will actually become quite ubiquitous, even on the edge devices, um, when reinforcement learning actually picks up. Right? Like reinforcement learning is the way right now that uh, the large models are being trained to go beyond what is possible with just the existing uh, web-based databases, data sets. Basically what you're doing is raising the level of abstraction here, right? The, yes. the LLM is actually looking for agents that actually can go do this kind of work for you. Yes, and uh, on the data center, we already have coding agents, search agents, uh, we have browser-based agents, uh, we have tools that actually can uh, go and read the entire uh, report, financial reports, and try to summarize that and call the agents one after another to be able to summarize that, understand chart. So there have been many specialized agents that have been developed, and uh, they're more cheaper, obviously. The agents, because they're specialized, they are much more cheaper to execute than executing a very generalized large models. So given all this, given this amount of complexity that you have to use in the computing here, what do you have to do to design the hardware so that it takes advantage of this? One of the key aspects I already stressed upon is that we need to be able to maintain the bandwidth and utilize the bandwidth in the best possible way. So we need to make sure that the compute and bandwidth are almost always parallelly active. And based on how much application process or area budget that you have, um, you can actually think about even running multiple models simultaneously on even on the edge devices. Because then what you're doing is you are balancing a compute intensive model with the bandwidth intensive model. We also need to make sure that we have specialized understanding of what kind of execution needs to happen, right? Like attention processing, for example, requires different precision level to be able to still maintain the accuracy. Um, as well as like there are different types of attention that you can use in LLMs. Like uh, multi-rated attention is much less expensive on bandwidth, but much more expensive on computations. So these kind of trade-offs while des designing an LLM or defining the LLM for edge devices will actually help navigate the space and reduce the cost required on the edge. And so this is actually operating outside of, say, a GPU or something, right? Where you're saying, okay, here's how you really speed this up. It isn't necessarily by processing individual uh, bits faster. It's also by making sure that the bandwidth is there and that the amount of data that you need to move is less and, and controlled. Yeah, so uh, GPUs on the edge are not that power friendly, first of all, and, and neither they are area friendly. Uh, they require very high bandwidth memory and all these restrictions make GPU not the best fit. Uh, like, they're, they're a good fit for data center because they're programmable, especially for training. But uh, for edge devices, we run into so many constraints. Uh, there is no batching. So getting the utilization out of GPU is going to be extremely difficult because it's a SIMD architecture. So uh, what we are like looking for is creating a architecture which is flexible enough. Like as you change your quantization, it can change how it can operate and it can still give you the best possible utilization. We are building a streaming engine with ability to do inline uh, compression and decompression, which allows us to actually utilize the bandwidth very effectively while maintaining uh, the parallel execution units always active, right? Like we always want to keep attention units or computer matrix multiplication max always active. And finally, uh, we have a specialized attention engine or attention core, which can allow us to just quickly focus on uh, accelerating the attention part of the mechanism while minimizing the amount of data that needs to be stored around for large context. Sure, Choi. Thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome. Thank you.